Grab your Bibles and go with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, we finished up last week in the book of Joshua. And so for a summer, uh, summer preaching, we're going to have some standalone sermons over the next few weeks. And it's always a blessing uh, when, as a pastor, I stand up and preach on something that is fresh and something that's going on in my life. And I believe such is the subject today as we look at uh, a message that I've simply entitled The Pressure Valve. The Pressure Valve, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to explain that a little bit better uh, here in just a moment. In Matthew chapter 18, Matthew's Gospel, it begins with the disciples asking Jesus, who is the greatest? And Jesus calls a child to himself, and he says, unless you humble yourself, and you become like this child, uh, you will never inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's interesting to me. The disciples asked that question in Luke chapter 9. After they just laid an egg, and they were not able to heal the, uh, the man's uh, son who was demon-possessed, the scripture says they sat down and asked who is the greatest. How many of you believe that's not the question the church needs to be sitting around talking about today? We know who the greatest is. It's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus says you need to humble yourself. Humble yourself if you want to enter the kingdom of God. And then, of course, he mentions the fact that you would be better off if you tied a cinder block around your neck and jumped into a lake uh, than to offend a little child. He goes on and talks about offenses in verses 7 through 9, uh, the parable of the lost sheep, verses 10 through 14. And then in Matthew chapter 18, 15, we have this section of what to do when someone sins against you or does you wrong, you're supposed to go to that person, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. If that doesn't work, you go with two or three. And then, unfortunately, sometimes uh, people won't repent. And Jesus said, you need to tell it to the whole body. It is a matter of church discipline. I want you to look with me in verse 21, though, through verse 35 at a parable that Jesus gives about a very important matter for us in our Christian journey. It's known as the parable of the unforgiving servant. Peter speaks up and he comes and he says to Jesus, Lord, how often, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, 77 times. Some of your translations say 70 times 7. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me. I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, notice, and pleaded with him, and basically said the same thing that he had said previously, have patience with me and I will pay you. Notice verse 30, he refused and he went and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all the debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I want to talk to you today from my heart, from the Word of God, 
about this important matter of forgiveness. Forgiveness. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'll move in this room where there's an angry spirit, give us a sweet spirit. Where there's bitterness, give us peace. Give us a release. Remind us now. Remind us of the great price that Jesus paid on the cross so that our debt could be eliminated. Just as we celebrate today our church debt being eliminated We also celebrate our sin debt being covered. And now we ponder the scope of that forgiveness. When we think about hurts, we think about challenges, we think about things that we've been through. God, when I think about some of the things that people in this room have been through, I want to weep. Because I know there's some deep waters. There's been some difficult days. Would you show us from this text that we can release it? We can lay it down at the foot of the cross. God, give victories today. Break chains. Set us free, we pray. In Christ's name, all God's people said. A pastor that I know, he and his wife about 30 years ago were having a conversation one day, and the conversation was, let's just do something different as a family. And so they had never been camping before, and they decided, hey, why don't we go camping? Well, they didn't have a camper, so obviously they had to go to a a rental place and rent a camper for the trip that they were on. The man they rented the camper from said, look, it's really easy peasy. Here's a manual for this camper. Uh, If anything would go wrong, just pull the book out, uh, flip through it. It's got instructions, very detailed instructions. Uh, You shouldn't have any problem. You'll bring this camper back to us. Well, they got on their camping trip and they got a few days into it. And his wife noticed that there was a red light lit up in Uh, by the sink and so he got this manual out began to flip through it and he discovered that uh, the holding tanks in the camper were full so what do I do about this well he began to read and he asked a couple people around and they told him that uh, over in the campsite there were some dumping stations you need to go over there and follow the instructions in the manual uh, how to dump the tanks out of the camper. So he said he went over there and he got that page, had it open, was following instructions, and there was one small problem, one thing that happened. It said on this page there was a pump on the opposite side of the camper and you were to turn that pump on and allow the pressure to build up And then you were to mash that button and let that air release, and it would dump the holding tanks into the ground. The problem was, as he was reading through that, it said one zero pounds of pressure. And when the manual printed, it was supposed to clearly read 1.0 pounds of pressure. So he said, you could just imagine in your mind, wife is on one side of the camper, he's on the other He's got the pump running. You can see where this is going. The pressure is building up. The pressure is building up. When he should have hit the release button at 1.0, he waits until it gets to 10. I was not there. There is not a YouTube video of this, but I trust this man that he is telling the honest truth. He says when he got to 10 and he hit that release valve, He said that hose came up out of the ground like the trunk of an elephant. And he said it began to spray all of that refuse all over a brand new camper that had just pulled into the campsite. How many of you glad that wasn't you that day, right? He hit that button and it became messy really quick. It certainly seems to me that we are living in a world today where people are on the edge. 
There's stress, frustration, anxiety seems to be ruling the day. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was a family that came to our community for vacation from Birmingham, and they were coming down Sorrento Road, and they got pretty close to the Perdita Bay Golf Club, and man, you think about it, you're almost there. Perdita Key, we're on vacation, boys and girls, we're almost here. They had a flat tire. So the truck's on the side of the road there by the Perdita Bay Golf Club, and so I turned around and went in and began to help them, had an air pump and so forth, and I was standing there and traffic zinging by, and kids are standing over here in the high grass, and what are we going to do? How are we going to get the tire fixed? And this lady pulled up to the stop sign there as we're trying to figure out what to do, and it inconvenienced her and made her day go really bad and south because this man had a flat tire and it was in her way. I stood there and watched her as she literally exploded. Profanity coming out of her mouth, pointing her finger, yelling. She slammed the vehicle up in reverse and peeled out backwards and, and, and drove off another direction. She was angry and she was mad because we were in her way. As she drove off, I began to think, I wonder why she's so angry. Why is she so upset? I mean, after all, how many of you believe in that moment it would have been better if she would have ran back to the house and got some bottled water for those kids? Or maybe been interested to see how I might contribute to someone else who is having a situation, but maybe she had something going on in her life in the moment. Maybe it was something that had happened in her past to where in this moment she was actually taking her hurt out on someone who did not deserve it. I heard someone say years ago that hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. When you've got an offense and you don't properly deal with that offense, you've been wounded, you've been attacked, you've been mistreated, you've been uh, maligned, you've been done wrong. If you don't deal with that properly, you will end up taking that hurt and you will project it on someone who doesn't even deserve it. I was out in L.A. the other day, and I got an Uber ride from a, a Polish man that had come to the States, and he was talking about the riots a couple of years ago and uh, out there in L.A., and he said to me, he said they were bringing bricks and stationing them throughout the city, and he said, I'm trying to do my job, and he said, people were throwing bricks at me. For what? I haven't done anything. Do you know how many times in our lives we throw bricks at people who don't deserve it? You know why? Because we're hurt. We've never properly dealt with the hurt. It was April 20th of 1999. It's hard to believe 23 years ago there were kids scattered all over the campus at Columbine Scott, uh, High School. And Rachel Scott and her friend Richard decided to go outside and eat their lunch on uh, the lawn. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold came up to them with assault rifles. They engaged in a conversation with them, and they asked Rachel about her fate, and Rachel ended up becoming the first victim in the Columbine High School shooting. She was a devout Christian who refused to deny her Lord in that moment, and those two young men took her life. What, an, what a horrible day. Fourteen students and a teacher lost their life, and unfortunately, we've had too many of them over this last 23 years. A couple of days after this happened, Rachel's mom and dad built up the courage to go into her bedroom for the first time. And her dad said as he walked in, he noticed there was a piece of paper sticking out between the mattresses. And so he reached down and he pulled that piece of paper out. He opened it up and in it, Rachel had written an essay about her personal ethics and her way of life. And in it she wrote about five ways that a person could show compassion to the people around them. And guess what number one was on the list? It was having a spirit of forgiveness. Forgiveness. A few days later, many had gathered in the school parking lot. Maria Shriver was there. 
national TV reporter, and she interviewed Rachel's father. She asked him on national TV how he felt in the moment toward these two young men, and his reply was such a powerful, powerful moment. Here's what he said. We have forgiven them. Rachel would not want Eric and Dylan to ruin our lives because of what they have done. How is that even possible? Just a few days after your daughter's life has been taken? That you could say to an entire nation, we have forgiven them. Another question I have is, how could those two young men, how could they ruin their lives if they're incarcerated? They're not free to do anything toward that family And we know that what Mr. Scott was saying is that it would be real easy for us to allow those two young men to bring bitterness into our life and anger into our life and unforgiveness in our life. Someone said, he who angers you controls you. You see, people can control you from a prison cell. They can control you from the cemetery. They can control you from the other side of the world if you allow that to happen. Someone said about Abraham Lincoln that his heart was as great as the world, but there was no room in it to hold the memory of a wrong. And I just say wow to that. How in the world could you live your life and have no ability to have a memory of wrong? You know why? Because life is sometimes difficult. Circumstances are sometimes difficult. People can be difficult. Wives, don't elbow your husband there, all right? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse number 7, Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses will inevitably come i prayed it just a minute ago that we all have hurts we all have habits we all have hang-ups you know what else we have we all have offenses we've all been done wrong friends family and unfortunately sometimes it's people that sit across the aisle from you on a sunday at church they don't always treat us right or treat us fairly My message today from Jesus is this. Life will present us many opportunities when we get to be most like Jesus when we are willing to forgive. So let me ask, here we go, in the room. If you have ever been done wrong, would you raise your hand? Wow. That's probably 100%. Anybody in the room ever been lied about? Anybody in the room ever been stolen from? How many of you, here we go, here we go. How many of you have been mistreated? Would you raise your hand? How how many of you today would say, I have been taken advantage of? How many in the room today would say, you know what? Unfortunately, I've been misunderstood. I've been misunderstood. You know why we have this stuff that comes to us? And when it does, we have one of two directions to go. We can take those things and allow God to use them and to shape us and to grow us more into his image. Or we can let Satan get a foothold in our hearts and and, and we can take those offenses and those wrongs and they will make us bitter. Someone said, That forgiveness is this. It's just a simple definition. definition. Surrender my right to hurt you for hurting me. I'm going to surrender my right. Surrender my right to hurt you for hurting me. Again, we all have hurts. And when we receive those hurts, we've got to make a choice what we're going to do with them. I love this book I've been reading uh, by R.T. Kendall. You've heard me mention it. A few times. I like when someone recommends a book and it's small, right? 
not a lot of pages. I mean, as a pastor, I have people, Pastor, you've got to read this book. And I look at that book, and it looks like an encyclopedia, right? And you're I ain't got time for that. But, but this book is called Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. And I want to tell you something. You've got to slow down. You've got to read it. You've got to pray through it. You've got to look up the Bible verses. And you've got to meet head on with offenses and unforgiveness in your heart. Uh, Dr. Kendall says he was the pastor of Westminster in London. He talks about early in the book how someone in the church hurt him and attacked his family, and he was having a hard time with that. So he sat down with a friend one day uh, to try to figure out what to do, and his friend said to him, I'll tell you, you've only got one choice. What is it? You've got to forgive. You've got to forgive. He mentions in that book an article that was written in Christianity Today by Michelle Nelson where she gives three degrees or types of forgiveness. And I want you to see these really quick. The first one is detached forgiveness. In detached forgiveness, there is a reduction in negative feelings toward the offender, but no reconciliation takes place. Detached forgiveness secondly there is limited forgiveness that means there is a reduction in negative feelings toward the offender the relationship is partially restored though there is a decrease in the emotional intensity of that relationship at times you're closer to people maybe uh, than you are currently maybe something happened and you're at a point where you're not as tight as you used to be but something happened, there's an offense there, and you're willing to deal with that even though you know that things are not going to go back and be the way they once were. The best case scenario, of course, is total forgiveness. Total forgiveness. That is where there is a total cessation of negative feelings toward the offender and the relationship is fully restored. When you preach a message on forgiveness, there's always going to be people who would say that will never happen. It can't happen because of situations and circumstances. And I know this. Maybe someone in the room right now is thinking, Tim, you, you just don't know. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know what happened. It's easy for you to get up there and preach at us and tell us to forgive, but you don't know the hurt that I have gone through. I can only imagine. As a matter of fact, as a pastor these 18 years here at this church, I've heard some horrible things. I've heard some horrible things. There are people in this room that have been through unimaginable things that you would even possibly say, how, how could they ever get over that? How? could they possibly forgive i suggest to you today that we are most like jesus when we are willing to forgive and you know what matthew chapter 18 verses 21 through 35 shows us the magnitude i mean jesus lays it out in this story to say this is my kingdom expectation here it is to whom much is given, much is required. And that not only applies to maybe a vocation or a ministry that you serve in, but that applies to your willingness to forgive. I love this story. Look at it real quick. I'm going to give you three simple statements and I'll be done about the release valve. Here we go. Ready? Number one, sometimes it's no small matter. Sometimes it's no small matter. It's one thing for somebody to accidentally bump into you and you say, and they say, oh, my bad, I'm sorry. You say, hey, no big deal. Don't worry about that. that that's a small matter. But how about a matter like Mr. Scott had to deal with at Columbine in 1999 when two young men took the life of his daughter? That's a pretty big deal. What do you do with that? I love the Apostle Peter. Peter is always inquisitive. He's always asking questions. Some say Peter had the foot-to-mouth disease, right? 
because he, he was always talking, always had something to say. And from verse number 21 that I read for you just a moment ago, we know this about Peter. Peter learned that we have to forgive. He had learned that from his Lord. If you're going to be a Christ follower, you have to forgive. Again, how many of you believe the Bible is not a book of suggestions? It's a book of commands. The Bible says you must forgive. So Peter knew that. Peter also knows from reading what he says here in the text, he realized that forgiving is hard. Forgiving is hard. It's difficult. Look at me. I read this this week. I don't remember who said it. Forgiving someone is some of the most painful work you will ever do as a Christian. Forgiving someone is painful. It hurts. It's not easy. And you can see that in Peter's tone here in verse number 21. Forgiving is hard. But we also know that forgiving never ends. Because it's going to be a lifelong work. It's a lifelong virtue. Notice Peter's question in verse 21. Lord, help me out here. How many times do I have to give the gift of forgiveness? Lord, I know that we're going to be done wrong. And I know I'm expected to forgive. But Lord, when can we say enough is enough? Anybody felt that way recently? I hear a few groans out there. Enough is enough. Notice that Peter says, Lord, how many times are we supposed to forgive? Seven times. Why did he say that? Well, in the Yoma, which is eight chapters, eight chapters in the, in the Talmud, which is the civil and ceremonial law recorded by the rabbis, the rabbis wrote, if a man commits a transgression, the first second and third time he is forgiven the fourth time he is not forgiven now why did they write that they took a statement by God in the book of Amos about the neighboring enemies of Israel and they made it into a universal rule putting a limit on God's forgiveness to three you only have to forgive three times and the fourth time you can hit that release valve and say no more I'm done. Have we not all been there? Can we get honest in the house of God today? Have we not all been there at some point in our lives? How much is enough? How much is enough? How long? How much do I have to put up with? And Jesus answers that question. The ESV says 77 times. Some translations say 70 times 7 and you read that and you think, well, at least there's some kind of limit, right? I mean, if it's 77, when I get to 78, I'm done. Hopefully, it's not 70 times 7, because that means we'd get to 491. Either way, whether it's 78 or 491, I'm going to explode. I'm going to tell them what I really think. I'm going to tell them enough is enough. I'm going to tell them good riddance. I'm done with you. How I many you know sometimes that makes your flesh feel good? Just to let it out. Don't sit there, you bunch of Pharisees. You're on customer service, and it's not going the way you want it to go. Yeah, you're not singing Kumbaya and quoting Psalm 23. You just kind of let it out, right? Here's the bad news, gang. Jesus was not putting a real number figure to limit our forgiveness. You know what we can do? We can all be scorecard people. Scorecard. I know what you did to me. I remember what you said about me. And we revisit. And we rehash the things that people have done to us. And then while we're doing that, and we're bitter and we're caustic and we're angry, we say things like, I don't get mad, I just get even. You know what we're really saying? I refuse to have a forgiving heart and a forgiving spirit. Hear me today, church. In Jesus' kingdom economy, that spirit and that attitude doesn't work. Because to whom much has been given, much is required. So Jesus pivots 
and he begins to tell a parable. Here it is. A king is balancing his books. And one of the men in the king's leadership who had been given a position of authority, many scholars say, maybe a piece of property, this maybe was a situation of tax farming. Here's a piece of property. You manage it. You work the crops. You make the money. And then you pay me this amount of dollars for every season that you have it. And we will have a deal. Tax farming. There's no information in Jesus' parable about actually what happened. We don't know if there was a drought. We don't know if this man fell on hard times. We don't know if he was a poor manager or if he was just incompetent. It doesn't tell us that he was shady. It doesn't say that he was dishonest. Leon Morris said the point of this parable lies elsewhere. It is the absence of the money and not the reason for its absence that matters for this story. Here's what we know. The time came to sell the books. This is the agreement that we had. This is what you owe me, and it's a lot of money. This dude was upside down in debt. He was up to his ears in debt. He couldn't plan his way out of it. He couldn't work longer hours. He couldn't come up with a new business model. He couldn't be more efficient. He was in debt, and there was no way up. And typically in the ancient world, when this man would have stood in front of such great power, the king, with this kind of debt, there was basically one option. He was going to be thrown behind bars. So the king looks at this man and he says, since you have such a great debt, you and your wife and your children are going to be sold so I can recoup all of this money. This man in this moment could not plead for justice because he was about to receive it. But here's what he does. The only thing he knew to do was to plead for mercy and leniency. Look at Matthew 18, 26. So the servant fell on his knees. Can you feel some sympathy? Can you have some empathy here? He falls down on his knees and he begins to beg, please have patience with me. Give me more time. I'll pay you everything. You know, sometimes we see people who are convicted of high crimes or they've done something wrong. And in our flesh, we can be such Pharisees. And we can say things like, you got exactly what you deserved. How about this? Don't put them in jail. Put them under the jail. And all this guy knew to do in the moment, he knew he was had and he was done. He was toast. The only thing he knew to do was beg for mercy. Now, I need to shift for just a minute and say, as you're reading this parable, what are you feeling? Are you feeling compassion for him? Are you feeling sympathy for him? Are you thinking... There is no way, there's no way that this king would forgive him of all of his debt. He doesn't deserve it. It's not even possible. The most important thing about this section is that you read these verses and you see what you need to see in the story. What do you need to see? You need to see yourself. You do know that's why Jesus told this story, right? So you would read this and you wouldn't go, man, that that doggone dude, he deserved it. I can't believe that. No, Jesus told this story to a group of people so that they would see themselves. This man is actually you and me. Why? Because we were born into this world with a gargantuan debt of sin that we could never get out from under we couldn't serve enough pay enough work enough give enough we are under the debt of sin and so the debt of my sin is so great it's so overwhelming that i'm crushed underneath the load of it i was helpless and i was hopeless but god who is rich in mercy 
and love and grace. He made a way out. I need to remind you today that our sin is no small matter. Our sin debt is no small matter. Be careful about calling your sin mistakes. No, our sin is sin against a holy and a righteous God. Our sin debt is great. And I want you to see in this story the second thing, that Jesus gives us more than we could ever ask for. This guy says, just give me more time. Just be patient with me. Please, I'm pleading with you. But an amazing thing happens in verse 27. Look at it. The king, out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. He did what? I mean, there are a lot of people today that would like to have a zero debt factor, right? I mean, completely wiped away. He forgave him his entire debt. And I need to pivot right here, and I need to make a beeline for Jesus. Because the subject of the Bible is Jesus. The subject of this text is Jesus. The hero of the Bible is Jesus. The servant here asks for more time, but he gets so much more than he ever asked for. Dr. Tony Evans calls this God's bailout plan. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God sent his son Jesus to pay the debt. Man is straining under the load of sin, but God in his mercy bells us out. He grants us a pardon. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says that Christ Jesus, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. That word bore there means that he was carrying a heavy load. The weight of our sin, Jesus bore that load. It was not the weight of his own sin, but it was the weight of my sin that he bore on the cross. My sin was nailed to the cross with Jesus. I caused his suffering. I caused his pain. Yet in love, I have not received what I deserve. I've received mercy because Jesus forgave me. So watch, church. Now that I'm a Christian, and I know what Jesus did for me on the cross, I'm most like him when I am willing to forgive those who have done me wrong. Now we could stop right here for just a minute. We could pause. I could, I could tell you my stories. I could tell you things that have happened to me. I could tell you times that I've been done wrong. You could do the same thing. And I'm telling you, there's some stories in here that are unbelievable, that are like Mount Everest kind of stories. But when it comes to our hurts and our offenses, and we think about being hurt, I'm reminded that when someone does me wrong, it does not rise to the level of how wrong I have done my Lord and Savior. He forgave me, and I'm most like Him when I forgive. And hear me today, I would never, ever, ever want to want to minimize the hurt that someone has experienced. I, I, would, I would never try to justify that which is wrong or, or say to you that you just need to act like it didn't happen and get over it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there are some people that are trapped. You're trapped in a spirit of, of unforgiveness towards somebody. And many times because you're hurt, you hurt people that are around you. And, and sometimes the smallest little thing can happen. And it's just like somebody took their finger and pushed the button on your release valve. And when that button gets pushed, things can get really ugly really quick. God sent me here today to remind you that Jesus gave you more than you ever asked for. 
should we not consider doing the same to others? Is there anybody in the house today that would just say, Tim, I'm that person. Jesus gave me more than I could ask for. Would you raise your hand up? Jesus gave you more, more than you could ask for. You know, that's the good news, right? The gospel. I want you to say those two words with me, all right? Say good news. Good news. Say it again. Hey, when you tell somebody that, when you've really got some good news, you don't say, hey, I've got some good news. No, you say, hey, man, I've got some good news. You're like, what? Let's hear it. I mean, it's like, we're getting excited here. When we talk about the gospel being good news, before there's ever good news, you got to hear the bad news. The bad news is that we're sinners. We're in debt up to our ears. We can't do anything about it. We can't work enough. We can't be baptized enough. We can't take enough communion. There's nothing we can do to get out from under the load of our sin. But the good news is Jesus came. And even though we are guilty and we deserve death and punishment and separation from God, the good news is Jesus came and he granted us a full pardon from all of our sins. A pardon. I mean, gone. 1830, George Wilson killed a postal worker. He was robbing a postal worker, and this person saw him uh, or stealing the mail, and so this person caught him, and so George Wilson killed this person. He was arrested, and of course, uh, he was tried, he was convicted of murder, and he was sentenced to be hanged. But President Andrew Jackson actually sent him a pardon through a series of events. And, and George Wilson did a very strange thing. When the pardon arrived, he refused to receive it. This just threw everybody into a tailspin. They didn't know what to do. Who would not receive a pardon that they were given? And so this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And Chief Justice Marshall, who was considered a great justice, wrote the court's opinion. And in that opinion, he said... A pardon is just a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. So George Wilson was hanged because he would not receive his pardon. Now please hear me today. I don't know where you're at in your soteriology and about salvation and there's a lot of passages that we love to study and read and so forth and so on but let me be very clear in this moment every single person every person that goes to a lake of fire that goes to hell they will go to hell because they reject the pardon they will go to hell because they reject christ christ came and Christ offers forgiveness and a pardon. That's why John chapter 1 verse number 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You can reject the offer of Christ's forgiveness. Or today you can surrender to the Lordship of Christ as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and drawing you to Calvary. And you can say yes to Him and you can receive freedom and forgiveness and you can have that load lifted off your shoulders. Maybe today you're not a forgiving person. You're an angry, bitter, caustic person because Jesus does not have residency in your life. I wouldn't be much of a gospel preacher today if I didn't say to you, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. There's not one person in this room that would stand up and say, I regret the day I came to Jesus. Because when you come to Jesus, you are always going to get more than you ask for. What are the implications now for those of us who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb? We read this story and we sit in amazement. Here's a guy that has been forgiven of so much. And we think, man, th th this load is off of this guy. He's got his wife and his family. They're not being sold. He's not going to prison. Surely he's going to be running down the street telling everybody the good news. I'm debt free. 
But what does Jesus tell us that he does? Notice verse 28, when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he grabs him and he begins to choke him. Can you believe this? Are y'all with me? Can you believe this guy? Some say this, this, this figure here is maybe a day's wage. I mean, a speck of sand. Just a little speck compared to what he has been forgiven of. And he walks up to this dude and he begins to choke him. And in anger he says, pay what you owe me now. This poor dude begins to plea the same kind of plea he did. Hey, man, calm down. Have patience with me. Give me a little bit more time. But verse number 30, verse number 30, look at this. What are the first two words? He, he refused. There are some of you here today, you tell people that you're a Christian, and I hope you are. You're not lying. But you absolutely refuse. To forgive someone that's done you wrong. And that's not God's kingdom economy. Jesus has given us a picture here of ourselves. He's giving us just a snapshot view of the direction our life can go when we don't understand how much has been done and given to us when we have to deal with someone that does us wrong or doesn't treat us the right way. You know the rest of the story, I read it for you. His fellow servants could not believe. Can you believe this dude? Can you believe what he did? So Jesus said they go and grab him, they bring him back in front of the king, and the king goes, are you kidding me? All the grace, all the mercy, the forgiveness, I could have done this, but I did this. And now you're not willing to pour it out? I saw earlier this morning a tweet. A pastor was preaching a couple weeks ago and he said this. He said, when we really think about the ocean of grace that is needed for our salvation, it makes us really think about just a thimble of grace that we need to forgive others. Man, I think that's good. Just a thimble of grace. That we need to forgive someone else. It doesn't depend on the other person. It doesn't depend on the other person's attitude. It doesn't depend on the other person's response. Forgiveness depends upon me and my heart and my relationship. Matthew 6.15, Jesus said, But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So can I wrap this up? Is that okay? Y'all like you're hungry, ready for lunch. There's some of us in the room right now that that really need to deal with this. This This is real life, gang. This is real life. Who is it today that you need to forgive? Remember this. Remember that forgiveness... Is not approving what someone else did. Forgiveness is not excusing what they did. It's not justifying what they did. Forgiveness does not always mean reconciliation. I think I said this a few weeks ago. Maybe I did in Alberta. I may have said it here. I was preaching in South Georgia several years ago in a church. And I was up preaching one night. And the church had a cemetery around it. And and I, and I was talking about forgiveness, and I said, there, there's somebody in this room right now, there's somebody buried out here in this cemetery that's still controlling you because you won't forgive. And this man came up to me after the service, and he said, how would you know? <laughs> I said, I didn't. I just know how we are. And he had that situation in his life. And you know what? You know what? You know what his story was? He's angry with his wife, he's angry with his kids, he's angry with his grandkids, he's angry with the government, he's angry with it. I'm telling you, there's some angry people today that just, maybe you're, maybe you're one of those people. Just get that button pushed, and that 10 pounds of pressure. Just like that camper I told you about a few minutes ago, 
And then it gets messy. It gets messy because we're unforgiving. And can I say this? It's silly to say, forgive and forget. I mean, that's silly. You're not going to forget what happened to you. You're not going to forget what's been done to you. I think what we can do is control our minds that we don't feast on it and, and just dwell on it all the time. And, and, and we, we claim 2 Corinthians chapter 10, casting down imaginations and strongholds of our mind. But you're never going to forget what's been done to you. But let me close by saying, we are most like Jesus when we are willing to forgive. The same forgiveness that has been granted to us, we must grant to others. Would you bow your head with me?